And it started by that. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic, because it's like, when I really worked with the course and seemed to work with it years ago and go into this state of mind, um, it's just that state of surrender to the moment, and then the, the world's words and the world's constructs and everything get used in a very miraculous and involuntary way by the Spirit, but you can't be identified with any of the words or the concepts, even that the Spirit uses. If you latch on to anything that's coming through your mouth, if you latch on to anything that you say, and try to hold to it, and stick to it, then you'll find that that'll get sticky too. It'll, it'll still take you away from the present moment. So, you know, Jesus was, was thought of, the parable of Jesus was kind of like a, a mystic on the move. A lot of mystics, you know, lived in caves and, and lived off in the wilderness and so on and so forth. And, and certainly Jesus had his times to going to the mountain praying and, and in the wilderness. But basically he was a public mystic. He did most of his teaching at eating with people and right out in the open. Which was, is kind of extraordinary when you have this state of this present momentness. And it's just expressing, and it seems to be in what we would call more of a public setting. It set off shockwaves in this world. In a cave, you don't set off so many shockwaves. When you're out <laughs> among the people and society, it's like big shockwaves. And they're still reverberating from those 2,000 years ago. And what we're really feeling now is, uh, I always knew in my mind that, that it wasn't about people. It wasn't about traveling to people, it wasn't about visiting people, it wasn't about friendship, which Jesus talks about in lesson number 76. You know, I am under no laws but God, so he, he puts friendship in the category of the ego. Even friendship. Because why? Because friendship's about what? People. And it's very temporary, and this is about awakening in your mind to know yourself as a Christ identity. So, we have seemed to allow these metaphors to be used. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the book, The Prophet, by Khalil Gibran. Yes. Isn't that a lovely metaphor in the sense that, you know, he's just like, he's really tuned in with the One, and then uh, Almitris, uh, the Seeress, races after him as he's getting ready to uh, take his ship and go off and sail away into the ocean, which is symbol of the infinite, he's ready to go out there, and she says, before you go, please speak to us of work, and speak to us of children, and speak to us of houses, and speak to us of, you know, she, they, they rattle off, and all the people gather around real quick, like, quick, get him, before he goes off in the ocean, and he's so happy, but let's get, let's get him one more time, and, and speak to us. And so, we are open to the metaphors of speaking, the Holy Spirit speaking through us, but but now, we're coming into a state of mind now, where we're seeing that it's not about working with people. It's not about working with people. I saw this years ago, which made it kind of fun. Pressure's off. <laughs> Talk, speak, walk, act, 31 countries, do it, everything. It's a lot of fun when it's not about working with people. If you think you've got to do something, or save somebody, or help somebody, or work something out with somebody, it's going to be a tough journey because it's not about working with people, it's not about friendships. Even our idea of collaboration is a nice stepping stone idea, but guess where the collaboration is? It's not really on planet Earth. It's in the mind. Even the collaboration's in the mind. Teacher of God can heal the world without a sound. Wow, without a sound. That, says, that doesn't say much for music. If you can heal the world without a sound, Charles is like... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Are you willing to let go of music? Are you willing to... This is the thing. You start to realize that there is no external world, and that is what the healing is. It's all about collapsing the inner and the outer, the idea that you have a mind and that there's a projected world that's out there, that there's people out there, even that there's a body out there. It's all about the collapse down into the moment, the holy instant, 
is where the salvation is. I had so much enjoyed listening to Ben last night. He's up vibing. He was just having so much fun last night. And and I was talking to some people today. I said in the morning meeting, I said just let him go. He can end up as a bass guitarist for who knows what and and this and that. You don't know. It, it's involuntary when you let go of trying to control your worldly life. And it's very relaxing when you realize that it's not about working with people. You don't have to work anything out in your interpersonal relationship. I know we're undoing psychotherapy and counseling and all that stuff, but this is a, it's a time. It's time now. I've done those things, or more like I've been done through with those things, and it was glorious, and it was joyful, and it was fun. But it was always from a state of mind that knew it was about the mind. That I knew at the beginning every lesson was my lesson in mind. And that it didn't have another meaning other than happiness and joy. Feeling the experience. That's what Ben was talking about with the story last night. Just going for the joy and then noticing that there's part that wants to evaluate. How am I doing? Or did I miss a note? That's the ego that asks the question, how am I doing? That's the ego that says, did I miss a note? Uh, M Michelle was talking about 19 years, you know, of a contract. She's got to hit the high notes or she's fired. <laughs> Woo! If you think about that from a personal perspective, night after night, that's, that's some kind of pressure that you would put up. Miss the high notes and you're fired. <laughs> Yeah, and even that we can use because it's like, it's an idea of the past. I existed in the past. I I was a musician for 19 years, and now that's what I am. And that's the pain. That's the pain. Is thinking in the moment I am I am this little thing when truly I am everything. And so where, wherever we just shrink down ourselves, however we shrink down ourselves, it will be painful. And so the pain will never be where we think it is. We think it's in many different specifics. We have many stories about where the pain is coming from, but it's not there. There's no pain there. It's just a story. The pain is believing we are something we are not. We are a body. We are a person. We are a little thing. We are a self-concept. We are an identity, we are a color, we are a gender, or whatever we, however we call ourselves. We are none of it, and the pain is coming from believing we are that. And, and it undoes also the idea of relationship. There is no relationship. There truly isn't, because there are no person. How can there be a relationship when there are no person? There needs two to be a relationship, but we are one. So how can you see a relationship anywhere? So even that, like maintaining relationship or trying to have a good relationship, improving relationship, wanting to have a better relationship, all of it is just a distraction from going within and from answering the call. And I feel it's really important because I feel in my experience everything has been given since I'm on this path and I gave my whole life over to spirits. And I seem to have been given absolutely everything I needed to this, for this awakening and I feel that's really how it is. Relationships are given by the spirit, you're given an assignment as we call it here. And, and this assignment has a purpose and the purpose is waking up to your true nature, letting all the stuff coming up and not trying to improve it, not trying to have it good, not trying to build up a self-concept or build up a, a marriage partner, build up being a wife or a husband, it's not, never about that. And I, I, had, I, I had been given a marriage, I got married with Eric and I stayed like, we are in the process of divorce and it's like all the steps have been given over and over again. And, and that's the beauty of it because there is no pain in it, there is no loss, there is no sacrifice, there is no suffering. And when you let your life be given by spirit, instead of thinking that you have to make a life, or even imagining that you have a life of your own. This is so painful, just imagining that you have a life. If you have a life, you have to maintain it, you have to make sure that you're going to keep it. It's just so painful. And so all of that is just to realize that we are none of it. We have nothing. We are everything. And so when you let your life be given a moment by moment by spirit, you realize that the idea of loss is impossible. The idea of suffering, the idea of sacrifice is impossible. 
And still, you will probably seem to take many, many steps and letting go of a lot of things and a lot of shift might probably happen in your life. But it's not about that. It's all about releasing all the blocks in the mind or everything that blocks the awareness of your true nature and and really allowing the symbol to be given is the insurance for you that spirit is in charge of your life and that you have no idea of what's best for you and that truly managing a worldly life is something very tiring and there's a great joy to really let the spirit <coughs> use it the way he wants and let everything be given because you're coming from this place of wholeness you're coming from true, your true nature, this wholeness, where you know that you already have everything. You already are everything, and you absolutely need nothing. So if it's not given, if you seem to have a thought that you should have that, or you should be like that, or you should do that, and it's not given, really clearly given, it's just sh shifting your perspective on things. It's not given, so you don't need it. So you're not in this place of lack constantly where you think that something is missing but you realize that you already have everything and that nothing is missing and therefore you realize that you are, you are the whole and that whatever is given is just bonus all the time, you're just winning, it's like you are winning at the lottery all the time like bonus, bling, 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 bonus, bonus and you realize, and that's really what it is you're the one, and that's what it is. It's just like, let's rejoice in that. And realize that nothing has ever been missing, and there was never any mistake. And someone was talking to me about my innocence when I arrived, I don't remember whom. And it's like, yeah, let's rejoice in our true innocence, where nothing has ever been wrong, because everything has always been happening exactly the way it was supposed to be. And when you see that, and you use that for only one purpose, remembering who you are and seeing that you've never been the one living this life, that this body is not who you are and that life is happening the way it's happening and it's beautiful when you are in this perspective, your whole world changed and you realize that there is no need for any concern from the form of your life. If you give it to spirit, only happiness, only joy, that's, that's all you're going to have. So we've called this a music festival and an enlightenment retreat, so let's, I want you to actually join me in going into this experience of enlightenment. This is not some kind of retreat that you go to and you return back to a normal life. This, I'm going to invite you now to come with me and look into my eyes and I call you out of the world. And I'm very sincere about this. I'm, we're going into this. In fact, there's a, a part in the Manual for Teachers where Jesus is asked the question, how many teachers of God does it take to save the world? And I see Sundari's finger go up. It's one. Okay, everybody remembers that part. Now, Jesus goes on, though, to describe that one. He has, he has some, a very interesting thing to say about that one, which is very important, that 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 one that we're talking about is not a body, he says, and not in a body. I like the second part, and not in a body. So if you're joining me right now and you still perceive yourself as in a body, if you still have a locus of, of control or a locus of observation that still seems to be looking through two eyes, or hearing through the ears, even though I've told you they're projectors and speakers, uh, if you still are perceiving yourself as in a body, then that's not enlightenment. And, and we're talking about going together into a state of mind that goes beyond that perception of the world, into an expansive perception. Like, we were here uh, yesterday and Nina brought up that she, what she really got from the, let, you know, the end of time movie was this thing of existence. That, that I exist, we, we all talked about it, I exist everywhere. Now, that existence does not mean that you literally exist everywhere in the world. I was talking a lot about the quantum field, and I was talking about unified perception, and that's the existence I was talking about. But the quantum field 
is not in this world. It's not in this world. You, you cannot know yourself. In fact, I'll go so far, you can't even know forgiveness or atonement if you stay perceiving yourself as in this world. I mean, you know, I've heard all the Bible quotes and be in the world but not of it, yada, yada, yada. We're going into a state of mind, if you're ready to go into it, and ready to look at the obstacles to it, of an actual experience of not feeling located. Because you don't exist everywhere like in particles, or granules, you know, we talked about. It, you don't exist anywhere, everywhere in particulars. It's like the one who is enlightened knows he is not a body or in a body. That's why it shouldn't be surprising that he says things that you can tell you practice well by this, the body should not feel at all. You start losing feeling as we go into this today, you start losing awareness of your body or losing feeling in your body, and you go with me, then that's good. That's a good thing. It's not a bad thing that's happening. Don't think you're getting paralyzed or numbed out. That's a good thing. Everyone talks about feelings, feelings, feelings. Well, we said there's two emotions. If you go into this state, you will have that lit up emotion of joy, and the other one is gone and never was. Well, that's what this is about. Now, we talked about existence, and when Nina was talking yesterday, it just, I was just praying a little while ago, and I thought, Nina was talking about, I, I, I exist, I exist, I exist, I exist. And, and I was thinking of the movie, uh, from our movie watcher's guide, The Nines. Anybody here seen The Nines? Okay, you remember what that story's about? The main character starts to discover that he is the architect of worlds, many worlds, and all the characters in his perceived life, and other experiences they have of all the realms, is, is he starts to realize he's the architect of all the people that he's ever experienced, including the person that he thinks he is. He sees He's been the architect. We could say the ego peopled the world, is what Jesus says. The ego peopled the world. God didn't people the world. God's not a, a creator of people. It's the Bible say God is no respecter of persons. God is spirit. So the people have been part of the mask, and that's why you have to let go of friendship, and you have to let go of it all, including working with people. You know, that'll talk about letting go of your career goals <laughs> for most people. Letting go of working with people, that, that's a good start. You're going into a mind experience. So then you get into the, the text, you get into the middle of the text, and, and he says, at no single instant does the body exist at all. Okay, existence. At no single instance does the body exist at all. So if you're going for existence, now you see why you can't exist as a body or in a body. If you have a perception of existing in a body, you've got to let go of all your great Wayne Dyer metaphors, you know, about a spiritual being with a body. You smile and you laugh and you go, yeah, 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 now, no, 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 no. <laughs> you've got to let go of those metaphors if you're going for enlightenment. This is a music festival and an enlightenment retreat, and that's what we're talking about. It's truly empty your mind of everything you think you think and think you know. Letting go of, of the next. Uh, I like that movie. Uh, we have a movie called Next, Nicolas Cage, but it's such a quantum movie. It gets By the end of the movie, it gets into superposition and potentialities and possibilities. And we're talking about going beyond that, even. Beyond potentialities, beyond possibilities. It's an actual state of mind. Yeah, this movie is actually awesome to really show that all relationships are totally impersonal. And, the, and in this movie, this guy has, a, has an assignment with a girl and also with a, an FBI agent. And you see that the, play, the part he plays in this movie is beyond him. The purpose is beyond him. All of the characters, they, they play their part, but it's beyond them. And that's what it is. It's any pur the purpose of any relationship or assignment or anything is really realizing that it's beyond the personal. It's never between person. It's never, it's never between form. It's always beyond it, and it is it 
it is the script is written, so it is how it is, and we don't have any control over that. And coming in this realization that we don't have any control over the form, and the form will be what it is, is, is amazing because it changes the whole perspective on everything. It releases any idea of guilt, any idea of blame on anyone. How can someone do something wrong? How can someone treat me badly? How can I be a victim of anything when all the roles have already been scripted and given to each of us, to everyone? How can blame and guilt stay there when you realize that you're not the doer of existence? Existence is, and that's all. Yeah, and, and we have used the metaphor in our communities where we will link together, join together. We've had some um, questions, Sundari brought that up, like, I, I want to practice this with my group if possible, and this and this. And what we're saying now is, you know, you have all the answers inside of you. You really do. You, you know everything. If there is something to be given, all it takes is your willingness to allow it to come dropping into your awareness. You don't need gurus, you don't need teachers, you don't need mentors. In the end, you're going to have to come, if you're going for enlightenment, you have to transcend, like I said in the, in the get, end of time movie, you're going to have to transcend the mighties. I think it was Rick up there who said, I've got a dependency on the mighties. <laughs> and I said, okay, let's look at that. And he said, you know, I, I've got a dependency on the messengers. It's like the same with Jesus and Buddha and Krishna and all these Adi Shanti and Muji and all these David and all these characters. Please give it up. And, and if you're going to go into this experience of enlightenment, you have to let go of the idea of guides, of way showers, of avatars. There's no avatars in enlightenment. Avatars are what? Part of a linear construct. Still. Linear constructs, saints, linear, enlightened beings, linear. It's all coming down to a state of mind, and it's not a matter of time. That's why I'm giving you this invitation, because I know it's not a matter of time. It's not a matter of time. You don't have to wait on this. Be not content with future happiness, for it is not your just reward, for you have cause for freedom now. That's a quote from... The section, the immediacy of salvation, it's never going to happen in the future. The future is just a defense against it. And so whenever we try to do something on time, oh, I'm busy now, I'll talk to you later. Uh, I, can't, I can't do it now, I've got something later. Maybe later, maybe later, 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 later. Why would you take your salvation and make that a later thing? Why not jump into this quantum moment, I call it, where you start to question, just for a moment right now, the life that you believe that you have to go back to. Because we've already established there's no existence in the body. So you're not even existing in, in a love's nest in Utah. There's no existence here. Empty. Empty. There's no existence in Utah. I hear people now, they say, I, my life's purpose is to make it to Utah someday. <laughs> oh, man, that's really small. That's, that's what you're doing. <laughs> make, it to, make it to the community, to the ashram. Oh, please. You can do better than community and ashram. You are the whole. As my friend Donna Marie Carey heard from Jesus, you are the very thing you've been searching for. The very thing you thought you needed more of. Guiltless, sinless child of God, love is all you are. It just came pouring through, but, if, but let's take it now to a here and now experience. So, the person you think you are is not the existence that I'm talking about. The people in your lives, that's not the existence I'm talking about. The places where you got to go back to Canada, Massachusetts, where California, Indiana, wherever. Believe me, you're not going to find any existence there either. And you won't find enlightenment in location. You have to actually give yourself permission to delocate. And again, this is not 
a matter of time. I don't want you to conclude. Well, that sounds good. When I get home, I'm gonna, I'm going right to that. No, that's not home. That fictitious place that you think you could even return to. And some of you think, well, I'm not returning. I'm staying right here at the monastery. No, that's not the fictitious home either. It's not a place. We have to get so much in the joy of the moment that, that literally the time collapses and, and literally that's all that we're left with is this moment. Really, this, this is really it. You know, this is it. It's not, even if you go and you try to look at schedules and look for all the future, where will David be and everything, you know, you will not find me on the timeline. You may look for me there, but you will not find me. I amness is not inside this world. And this is a call. And whatever you've been hesitating on, whatever you've been avoiding, this is a good moment to just take an honest look at that. Oh, I'm going for enlightenment, but, 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 dot, 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 dot. Take a good look at those dots. Because you're trying to hold back God with those dots. Dot, dot, dots. Kind of interesting to think three dots to hold back <laughs> the Creator. You know. So this, this is the opportunity. That's what it is. This, this is it. We really, really want you to be sincerely looking at this. Because it's not a matter of time. It's not a matter of time. And even the metaphors of the Holy Spirit's use of time. Okay, what do you think that's all for? For now. <laughs> that's what it's aimed at. It's aimed at right now. Not lingering on the timeline. Yeah, and it's really the opportunity to really sort out what's valueless from what's valuable. And all that is time, basically, is valueless, whatever it is however it looks like, or however it seems, and all that is out of time is what is truly valuable. And that's really the invitation, the recognition that is available right here and right now. Just to, just for one moment, take it and let go of everything, just right now, everything that you think is valuable, and realizing that it's all absolutely valueless. And give yourself to this moment, just right now. And see what's left. Because there truly is nothing more important than that. That is life. Everything else is death. Death is not about a body disappearing. Death is every moment you are not choosing the spirit. Every moment you believe yourself in time. Every moment you value something that is totally wrong. And it appears in many, many forms. And it costs you your very existence. And you've heard me speaking for 20, 25 years about mind training, and the Course in Miracles says an untrained mind can accomplish nothing. So now I'm going to talk about the real thing. I'm going beyond mind training. I'm going to tell you that persons don't have to have their minds trained because they don't exist. The mind training is letting go of the people. The 
my training is actually letting go of the thoughts of people. The ego of people of this world. And if your mind isn't still, if you go seemingly through a day, or the construct of a day, constantly thinking about people, you've got a people addiction. God is no respecter of persons. God didn't create him. The ego put him there. The ego peopled this entire cosmos. And if your mind is focused on people, taking care of people, nurturing people, or you're hating people, and you're despising people, if you're attracted to certain people, and, you're and, responsible. Re and responsible for people, or repulsed by people, you've got a people addiction. It wasn't long ago, I was sitting in the house giving a session within the past year sometime, I can't even keep track of these things anymore, but it was, I was going to start talking about our two guidelines, community guidelines, thoughts about people pleasing, and the Holy Spirit came out of my mouth and I looked at everybody and I said, no people thoughts. Everyone. Was that a slip of tongue? No. That was not a slip of tongue. If you want to go into mysticism, if you want to really quit playing games with the Course in Miracles, playing games with salvation, and making it about all kinds of things, let's get down to the nitty gritty of its the, it addiction of thinking about people on the timeline. That is the problem. And isn't that what Time's End, the movie, showed us? That it was the addiction to the people, to the linear perception of all the people that was denying existence. That was actually denying the experience of existence. Now, you may say that's radical, but I would say that's natural. The words that I'm up uttering are coming from eternity, and it's just a call from eternity to come back to the experience of eternity. That's what this is right now. It's not pussyfooting around. There's no molly coddling. There's no compromise with this. We're, we're slicing through delay mechanisms. And we're coming down to seeing that if you're thinking about people, positively or negatively, past or future, that is the addiction. It's a people on the timeline addiction. And it's, it's thoughts. They're just thoughts. They aren't your real thoughts. You can actually let go of that. So you can see that for the community, our counseling is winding down. Having people coming, talking to us. Well, you know, I'm really interested in enlightenment, but here's what's holding me back. And then we listen for 25, 30, well, my gosh, it's two hours. Uh, minutes of, of all this jabber, 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 jabber about issues and people and everything, you know, I can't, I don't want to let go of this, I don't, I don't feel it, I don't feel it. I'm in pain, but I don't feel what my next step is. Listen, we're through giving next steps. We've been doing it for 20 some years. I have people that call me and they say, David, ask Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and then they go through the thing, and then after they tell me what to ask Jesus, I start to speak and I go, shh, shh. give him time to answer. <laughs> Putting me in the role of a channel. I am not a channel of the Holy Spirit. Don't confuse me with a body. I am not a channel. I am not a scribe. Those are concepts. Those are linear concepts. The voice of eternity is saying, come home to an experience. Come into an experience. Don't hold on to these metaphors. Don't perceive myself or yourself as a body. It's not really humble much more humble to, to go inside and open to a vast experience. Now that's humble, that's true humility. 
we've been listening to a lots of chatter and what could be called excuses, excuses. I, I, in the parable of David, I had students that came to me back in the 1990s. I remember sitting around with them one time in 1990 and I was telling a Chris Bernie parable and has anybody heard of the Course in Miracles teacher Tara Singh? Yes. Yeah. Tara Singh went through a phase of his life where he just fell so in love with his teacher and guru, uh, J. Krishnamurti, that Tara Singh decided, I have to go and be in his presence. I have to actually be in his physical presence. Well, Krishnamurti was kind of like the parable of David. We, we tend to hippity hop around the continents, so you know, you have to actually track us down a bit to try to find out where, we, where we, the body seems to be. But anyway, so he was, he was hippity hopping, trying to hippity hop to catch up with Krishnamurti, who's like here, and then the next con, and the next con, and the next con. And finally, he gets around Krishnamurti, and he can't get in to see him because he's got too big of an entourage. Uh, he can't get past the entourage. And so he tries and tries and tries. It goes on and on and on until finally, you know, he gets what's called like an audience, like they have an audience with Sai Baba, you know, an audience with Krishnamurti. He's done a lot of tracking, a lot of traveling. He's trying to catch up with Krishnamurti. He can't get past the, the whole, you know, group, the flock that's around in the entourage. Finally, he tries and tries, and he, he has to keep traveling because Krishnamurti keeps moving on. He can't get past the entourage. Finally, he, he's told, okay, Krishnamurti has granted you ten minutes. Ten minutes audience. So here are, here's how the ten minutes go. He finally gets in there, and he comes to Krishnamurti, and he, he, Krishnamurti just stares at him. No words from Krishnamurti, just looks him in the eye. And Krishnamurti kind of gives him a look like, okay, you got what you wanted, what's the point? Just a look. And then finally, Tara saying the time is ticking, down to nine minutes. <laughs> quickly wants to get some words in, he's like, I, I want enlightenment, I want salvation, I want self-realization, I, I want to know who, who I really am. He, he just, <laughs> he spilled about two minutes to get out what he wants, you know, because he can feel Krishnamurti, the time's ticking, and he's got to quickly tell Krishnamurti what he wants. And so he goes through the whole spiel for a couple minutes, now it's down to 37 minutes, and Get a little pressure for Krishna, for uh, for Tara Singh, and then uh, finally, out of Jay's mouth, comes three words. He's gone all this with this for three words. Three words. What's stopping you? <laughs> and then silence again. The eyes of Krishna Murray peering at him with one question: What's stopping you? Well, I'm, I, I have a house, I'm from India, you know, uh, Sikh religion, and I, I, I'm a householder, I, I have a wife, I have children, I have duties, I, I have uh, obligations, I have responsibilities, and then uh, he goes and gives it to me. Okay, Krishnamurti's response, two words. This is two of the only five words that Krishnamurti will speak. This is the reply. The reply will take two words. Let's go. Drop them. <laughs> Drop them. I loved how telling that parable. Uh, I told it to the students at the beginning. I remember back it was on 1993. Just started squirming on the chairs. Oh. I, did you like the parable? It, it's a beautiful parable. It can point you right smack dab into the heart of God and salvation if you like this five word <laughs> parable from Krishnamurti and really that's really what A Course in Miracles and all of the perennial wisdom is about identify what you believe you want and desire from the world and be willing to drop them isn't that what Buddha taught? is that any different? And this is about an experience. The reason those five words, what's stopping you and drop them, are important is because your whole experience of peace and joy and happiness, your whole return to eternity depends on your response in that sense to the parable. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, really rejoicing, actually. I just feel a lot of joy. And I just want to share, like, we, we are so many, actually, of having taken those steps, really. Letting go of everything. Letting go of family, letting go of marriage, letting go of money, letting go of position, letting go of absolutely everything. Of relationships, or jobs, or roles, whatever we were playing. And we're here to tell you that it's worth it, really. There's nothing like it. <laughs> nothing like the experience that we share. And that's the only thing we can truly share. Sharing is n has nothing to do with materialism or physical position or with anything that is in the world. The, the, the only sharing there is, is this experience of, this experience of oneness. And that's what we are in inviting you in. That's what we are all calling you in. And yeah, we are like all of them here, like we've taken so many steps. And yeah, we were there for each other, supporting each other. And that's what Mighty Companions are all about. And also just for you to just really feel what is your true calling? What is the deepest calling of your heart? Is it to be a mother? Is it truly to be a wife? Is it truly to be a um, company director? What is it? Is it to be a baker? Is it truly that? What is the deepest calling of your heart? Because that's what we are talking about. We are talking about life. We are talking about reality. We are not to talking about littleness or shrinking down or fear. We are talking about the greatest joy that has ever been. We are talking about enlightenment. And that's really the invitation. And we are not about talking about saying the words and not taking the steps. Because words is easy. Everyone can speak the words. But we are not into listening anymore. We are really just inviting you in the experience and to share the only thing that can be shared, which is our true nature.